that works. That's almost as good as go green. Let's try that again. Go green. All right. I think some of you are sleepy from Tina last night. <laughs> I think we were all fired up after that performance. So it's great to have so many of you with us this morning and last night at a spectacular performance at our very own Wharton Center. Um, welcome. My name is Kim Tobin, and I. this is now my second Women in Philanthropy. I know there's only been two uh, Women in Philanthropy Symposium, but I'm thrilled that I'm cycling through on my second, uh, start to be the start of my second year at MSU as Vice President of University Advancement I began last May and we were all together shortly after that in the Breslin Center and it was um, just so so warm and welcoming being with all of you. I think there's nothing like a group of women and women philanthropists. Um, the sense of community, the sense of commitment, the sense of action, leadership, inspiration, you have it all and represent all of that here. So looking forward to spending the day with all of you and we have a great lineup. So I want to thank our team in University Advancement. Um, uh, there's a great group of people People, Amy and Sarah and our events team and the regionals. I see a lot of people in who've brought guests, uh, people I've met, Ethel in Texas, and we show up in Florida together and who knows where these Spartans are going to pop up. But welcome to all of you and thank you to the team. Let's give them a round of applause. So we have a lot of amazing women uh, leading this institution, and you've gotten to know probably several of them um, along your journey. And uh, it's my pleasure to have one of our Board of Trustees members here to uh, say a few words and welcome us. But um, I just wanted to thank Renee Kanaki Jefferson for all that you do. Um, you also provide great inspiration, level-headedness, and a lot of thought and intelligence to everything you do. And she shared with me, and I don't know if you know, she has. Uh, this is her most recent book, Shortlisted, Women in the shadows of the Supreme Court. And I am just getting uh, started on this. So um, I just wanted to, to share that uh, title with all of you because I think it's uh, really inspiring work and important work that um, we have depth and uh, expertise in our, in our trustees and in our leadership at the institution that sometimes we don't know about. So uh, congrats on your uh, publication. And uh, with that, let's uh, welcome Trustee Je Jefferson. <clears throat> Good morning. It is my honor and pleasure to, on behalf of the Michigan State University Board of Trustees, welcome you all, welcome you back to campus. I'm curious how many of you were part of that inaugural Women in Philanthropy event with us last year? How many of you are coming? OK, so then you know what I'm about to say. For me, the most memorable aspect of that time together, it was the stories. The stories that I learned from all of you in the room, from the women who will take the stage, from the conversations you will have around your tables that will flow into your tours of campus and your strolling dinner this evening at Cole's house. The stories that brought you to Michigan State for the first time, maybe as a student or maybe like me as a faculty member, and that keep bringing you back to be engaged, to give of your time, to give financially, to give of this moment that has brought us all here in this room over the course of today and tomorrow. And so thank you for giving in that way. And I really encourage you to absorb and be inspired by each other's stories during this time. Now you've heard, of course, I, in addition to being a trustee, I'm, I'm also a law professor, and maybe I'm really into women's stories because that's what I do in my research. I go out and I find the untold stories of women who pioneered the way, who literally opened the doors to public spaces and professional spaces when women were previously excluded. And I tell those stories. So that might be why I'm so struck by the stories that I have learned from all of you and I am looking forward to hearing more of today. I was born in 1973. When I was born in this country, a married woman could not take out a credit card in her own name without her husband's permission. It would take the work of women to earn that right and an act of Congress to secure it in 1974. It is not lost on me that in this room we are a generation of women who enjoy a level of financial autonomy that our mothers didn't, that our grandmothers didn't, that the women who came before them. And to be sure, there's a lot more work we need to do to secure equality and equity for women in this country. But we are at a critical moment in time in terms of the autonomy we have as individuals 
and importantly, collectively together. You know, it kind of makes me laugh, the idea of thinking of asking my husband Wallace for permission to take out my own credit card. And indeed, our own philanthropic giving, it reflects our autonomy and also ourselves as a couple. We, we give as a couple, but we also give individually. I think about how we give here to Michigan State. Wallace is an alum. He graduated from James Madison. He came to Michigan State both for James Madison and because he wanted to see Magic Johnson play basketball. You might imagine that his individual giving reflects that. And of course, he wants to pay back because his education here at Michigan State set him on a course that would lead him to be the first African-American Chief Justice on the Supreme Court of Texas. For me, I, I'm, I'm admittedly not an alum, but I really do feel I got my education at Michigan State as an academic. I spent 10 years on the law faculty. That was the first academic home for me. And when I left, I wanted to pay forward the door opening that had happened for me. And so I established a scholarship for women who will come next to continue opening doors for themselves professionally and in public life and bringing others along with them. And so if I can leave you with a, a charge for our time together over the coming hours today and into tomorrow, it's this. Really take a moment to listen to the stories around you and importantly share your story. We want to hear it. You're going to inspire each other. And also, let's really celebrate and honor the financial autonomy that we have as individual women and collectively when we think about what will our legacy be in the future, how will we continue to give so that we can further empower women. And now this leads me to introduce a woman who uh, has dedicated her whole career to empowering other women, and that is our interim president, Teresa K. Woodruff. Dr. Woodruff is a leader in higher education and an internationally recognized biologist. She specializes in reproductive science. She's a champion for the inclusion of women in STEM disciplines and fundamental research, receiving the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Mentoring from President Barack Obama in 2011. She holds many academic and professional honors, including the 22 Distinguished Woman in Higher Education Leadership Award from the American Council on Education Michigan Women's Network. Beginning her academic leadership career at Northwestern University, there she served as a dean and associate provost for graduate education before joining us at Michigan State in 2020. As a provost and executive vice president for academic affairs at Michigan State, she helped lead strategic planning in the provost's office and across MSU as the university strives to multiply its excellence, its equity, and its impact. She served the university as our interim president since November 2020, leading and advancing MSU's strategic priorities of student and faculty success, research and innovation, sustainable health, financial stewardship and environmental sustainability, and campus diversity and safety. We are so grateful for her leadership. Please welcome Teresa K. Woodruff. Thank you so much, Trustee Kanaki Jefferson, and thank you for all of your leadership for this institution, uh, now in your second term. Uh, and a full one, so we're all delighted that that is the case. And I want to echo uh, Kim Tobin's uh, thanks to everyone in advancement for what you've done, particularly Amy. We did it two years, so good job. I don't know where you are, probably working. There, there she is in the back. So congratulations to you and everyone uh, who has drawn us together around such an important matter, which is the way in which we build this uh, this campus uh, through uh, our action, through our time, and uh, through our uh, through our money. So uh, I and, and my husband Tom O'Halloran are also um, both delighted to sponsor many activities across campus, particularly in the arts, and we believe in Michigan State University. So I'm delighted to be here, and Kim's asked me as, uh, uh, as uh, Trustee Kanaki Jefferson indicated to kind of tell some stories. And so uh, I uh, decided and elected, and we'll see how this goes, but I uh, decided to call this What to Watch, Three Discoveries That Will Change Our Lives in the Next 20 Years. And in fact, uh, what I'm going to do is a little bit blend the interim presidency, which will be a little bit in the background for the first bit, with kind of that second part of my title, which is an MSU Research Foundation professor. 
So I came to Michigan State University um, uh, three years ago, and uh, part of uh, the reason that I was willing to join this great and storied university is that it is a member of the top 65 research universities in uh, North America, the uh, great uh, AAU. Uh, and also that uh, there was uh, a belief that we should be striving toward excellence in everything we do, including in our academic research. And so I'm going to tell a little story about the work that uh, I have done uh, starting uh, my career at Northwestern, but uh, here at MSU as well, as one of the exemplars of how we blend uh, research uh, with impact. And so uh, let me make sure I can, there we go. So I'm going to give you three parts to this uh, little story and then hopefully have time for questions. And I'll use the frame of a hypothesis, basically a statement that then through our dialogue we will test and probe and determine what the outcome might be. And the first hypothesis we'll probe today is uh, that I believe that the next generation of advances that improve the lives of all people will require fundamental discovery research that includes sex as a biological variable. And you might think, well, that somewhat makes sense because uh, each of us have a sex. But it turns out, and I want to give you a little bit of a warning, the data that I'm about to show you will actually tell you that, in fact, um, science and medicine do not routinely use sex as a biological variable, somewhat putting us back into 1973 when we couldn't get credit cards. Much of fundamental science and clinical medicine excluded females as part of the biological pipeline. So while that might sound upsetting, let me tell you what we've done about it over time. And this story uh, actually for me goes back to when I was a postdoc at Genentech, having, having just gotten my PhD at uh, Northwestern, did a postdoc there in the late 80s and early 90s when many of the breakthrough biologic medicines were just coming uh, into FDA approval. And so we had a drug that uh, is still used for stroke victims today. And uh, that drug was going through clinical trials. And I was one of two of the first postdoctoral fellows at, um, at this biotech. I was one of the first two biotechs in America using biologics in order to drive uh, medicine. And of course, now much of what we do uh, is in the biologic area. And so I was at a meeting, uh, um, the only woman at that meeting, uh, and a postdoc at that, one of two, and uh, they were showing some of the data on the clinical outcomes for um, this particular drug called Activase. Some of you or your family members may have actually used it. And they were showing the uh, clinical outcomes for 20,000 men. And so, you know, I kind of sat there and puzzled through that a bit and then raised my hand. And when finally recognized, I said, well, what happened to the women? And uh, the clinical uh, trial director um, looked at me and said, well, you know, um, just wait a minute. We've got another trial for, for you. So that was called the Gusto trial. So then a couple of uh, years later, two years later, in fact, was the JISI trial. And the JISI trial was presented to all of us at Genentech. And uh, that was um, very famously where the same clinical trialist said, and um, for Teresa Woodruff, I want you to know these were 20,000 Italian men. And uh, I thought, well, huh, that's interesting diversity. Uh, but by the way, Italian men aren't women. Uh, and <laughs> I don't know, sometimes you just have to puzzle through these things. And so uh, really in 1991, that led to my interest in really understanding that a lot of the biological pipeline really was absent females. Cells and animals and human clinical trials did not include females. Well, we worked in the 90s to include females in clinical trials, which finally occurred in 1998. And that was really a landmark uh, for many of us. And then this report, though, came out from the National Research Council in 2013. And it was looking from that 1992 date, which is when uh, the Gusto trial came out, to, uh, to 2002 to 2006, the interval looking at whether or not there was improving health or worsening health by sex. And the title of this says it all, Shorter Lives, Poorer Health. And what you can see in the red in the bottom are those by county by county. Those are where the health is worsening. And you can see very clearly that the health is worsening for females relative to males in the United States. And this is uniquely here in the, in the United States. 
And so when we talk about sex, what are we talking about? And we talk a lot about gender, but here we're going to talk about biological sex. And biological sex is determined by the genes that one has, and that in turn uh, uh, creates the hormones for the reproductive cy cycles. And many people think women are the only ones that have cycles, and I am here to tell you that women have, during their uh, premenopausal years from puberty to menopause, 28-day cycles. Men, on the other hand, have daily cycles. So I'm going to tell you that those daily cycles of testosterone going up and down really do profoundly change things like Wall Street and other decisioning. So uh, we had the hormones. And then, of course, the environment. And by the environment, I actually mean the microbio microbiota. It turns out that the microbiota of females and males uh, actually do have a sex. And that has come into play with a number of predispositions to diseases like uh, diabetes and other diseases. And it's a wholly new area that the work that I'll tell you about on sex inclusion now has opened up for a whole new generation of scientists. And then, of course, anatomy. The anatomy at birth, predicated on the genes that are expressed during development, uh, is dissimilar. It's not based on hormones. It's based on genetic expression within cells. So for example, if you take the heart muscle of males and females, and you remove all the cells, you can actually determine the uh, biological sex of that individual just based on the structure of that heart tissue. Each of these then go on to inform the overall expression of biological sex and something that's really critical for examination. Well, I told you that I started in 1991 with that first hand raised up at Genentech. And so I started from then until, uh, well, till even just recently, looking at these problems and trying to bring data and evidence to the matter at hand. And so this is a study that I did with one of my friends, Melina Kibbe, who's now the Dean of Medicine at Duke. And uh, we looked, in this particular case, at surgical research, but uh, I've looked at about 20 different disciplines uh, for the inclusion of females. And in fact, in 891, it was bad. If you looked at any kind of research studies, about 65% of those studies presented included uh, the description of whether or not there was a sex and that sex was male. Um, and then actually it got worse by 2011 85% uh, of those papers actually included only males. Well, that seems a little bit awkward when, in fact, uh, all, of the, uh, all of the work that goes into the medicines that we all take start there at, uh, at the fundamental science level. So then we look to see whether or not, well, maybe it's just that um, there are disease prevalences that folks were looking at. Um, and so what happens if we look at those diseases that are more prevalent in females? And in that case, 44% didn't specify the sex study. And of those that did specify the sex, 88% included only males. Well, this seems to be a little bit troubling. And in fact, I uh, started writing a number of papers. And I didn't put those slides in today. But uh, a lot of papers were written. I wrote one for famously for science and for some of the biggest journals uh, nationally and globally. And I thought, well, you know, here are these that are going to be published, and so there's certainly going to be a public outcry. So I need to have a media response plan. And so when my science paper and right after that a PNAS paper were scheduled to be uh, published, I worked together with my uh, communication director, and we put together a media response plan. And that paper was published, and I had my plan, and I sat by the phone. And I waited for the phone call. And I waited, and I waited and nothing happened. And eventually, I took that little plan, and I put it on the shelf, and went on to do uh, the work. And um, you know what this meant was, and perhaps you can say, well, you know, why couldn't you get any traction? Well, it turned out that it was a bit hard to disseminate to the general public. I was giving talks like this, and, you know, um, uh, and it was somewhat tough to generate the political capital. We had a women's caucus at the time, federally, and so I talked often with them. But they were fighting many, many battles on many fronts. And sometimes it was difficult to boil down to one sentence. And then something happened that really radically changed the story, which is that Ambien, uh, the drug that had been prescribed for 20 years, all of a sudden in, in phase four, or post-marketing surveys, uh, it showed that women were disproportionately being harmed by the Ambien dose they were taking. They take the Ambien, and the, it turns out that in the clinical studies, 
which most clinical studies only use females. Ambien actually used both males and females, but only used the dose for males. And in that study, they showed that the half-life, the clearance of Ambien from the system of females took longer than males. So guess what? Women would take Ambien at the same time a male would. Male woke up at 6 a.m., females woke up, but they were still sleepy. And so that drug was withdrawn from the market. And at that time, we had documented that eight out of the last 10 FDA-approved drugs removed from market were because of harm done to females. Now, what that means is many of those drugs actually still were effective for males, but we weren't actually gaining the power. We were simply removing them from market. And so um, that resulted, that Ambien trial, where Ambien was um, first removed from the market, and then because they, unlike the other eight and 10 drugs removed from the market, had actually done this pharmacokinetic study, they were able to change the dose for females relative to males. So this was a, a big story, and so um, we finally uh, got this call from the producers of 60 Minutes. And so that went on to, and I was able to tell the story multiple times, and, uh, and, um, the, but the most important and persuasive person in this whole story uh, happened to be Stephen Colbert. And so I brought a little clip. Actually, I didn't, uh, uh, I'm forgetting which part I'm going to tell. So this was, uh, you may remember this, and uh, this became a sensational story nationally, only ma males, not anymore. And 60 Minutes did this program, which was, and still I think remains, the top um, running story for Leslie Stahl in her career. So then Colbert picked this up, and uh, do I click again? I'm going to click again and let you just listen to the audio of this particular story. Uh, basically, he made the argument that um, um, you know, why don't we make, uh, so clinical studies are made um, as pure as possible. That means we cut out half the population and many other really great things. Uh, but as a consequence of this, uh, I, I went on and did some other studies. And now this one is a little bit, this is, well, why is it that for all of the scientific history, we've been getting more and more male dominated rather than including females? So I did a couple of studies, one of which was published right when I got to MSU, uh, and that was that it turns out that women earn 64 cents to a man's dollar in scientific prize, prizes. So if you look uh, at all the prizes, uh, you actually find that it's very similar uh, to the economic issues that we have in other parts of life. And in fact, women also receive less than $40,000 on their first NIH grant, the first federal grant women get, not because they ask for less, they get less uh, by $40,000. So you're already starting out at the beginning of, of your scientific career having to run faster and harder. Does that mean women are not achieving as much when they're in the scientific pathway? Uh, uh, no, they are achieving. They're just put at a disproportionate disadvantage from the very beginning. And so uh, it turns out that uh, one of these was, uh, I published this uh, in Nature with my friend Brian Utzi, and women who win prizes get less money. And actually, just last week, I got this uh, image from one of my friends from the Royal Academy of Science meeting with the, uh, with the uh, Nobel Prize Committee, uh, looking at sex and gender matters in prizes. And guess what they showed? Uh, my paper. You can actually see uh, my name down there. So. It, uh, it actually shows that this is still a, a, um, you know, a major uh, matter, and the Royal Academy is taking note. Uh, and so the question is really, are these apples and oranges? Is the fact that women get less money? Is the fact that women are less represented in the sciences? Is the fact that um, you know, um, we don't get recognized at the same level for the same kind of work? We get recognized for service and mentoring, but not for the science and the scholarship as often as men. Well, my point is, well, let's do the experiment. Let's actually see as if we increase the diversity of our um, scientific workforce, will we improve health? Will we actually now have folks asking a little bit more, uh, a few more questions about male and female cells, male and female animals, the inclusion of hormones in studies, and will that ultimately result in uh, improving the lives of all people? So. 
I, my first thing that will change the lives of all of us in the next 20 years is that, in fact, we now have the inclusion of all of us at the federal level. So on January 25th, 2016, I was finally able to get Francis Collins to put out a notice to uh, the community that all scientific studies that were federally funded required the inclusion of sex as a biological variable, or you had to explain why not. And so that really represents a breakthrough, I believe, for all of us, for our health in the future. And in fact, as I've told um, students many times, this opens up a whole new dimensionality to you for your scientific discoveries and the clinical work that will come out of it because we're now including all of us. And I think that's a really important breakthrough that will change our lives in the next 20 years. So the next thing that I want to tell, and I guess this is a movie that's also not going to work. Is that going to be the issue? So this is actually the largest cell in the body. And now we're moving to the second breakthrough. The largest cell in the body is the female egg. And uh, here, uh, and it would have been kind of squirting along on the side, uh, would be the smallest cell of the body, non-pejorative, this is biology, <laughs> is the sperm. And uh, so... Um, my, my studies in reproductive science have focused on the ovary and the processes of reproductive cycles um, in, uh, in females. And uh, there was, uh, it turns out I also have a husband that's going to be greeting you this evening. Some of you know him quite well, Tom O'Holler and my current husband, as I like to say. Uh, <laughs> it keeps him on the toes. And I did tell him I'd be talking about him today. And he will be hosting you this evening, as I will be with, uh, with our museum for the opening of a Smithsonian uh, exhibit on the Boreal Forest. So I do hope that many of you, during your time here, have the opportunity to go over to the museum and some gap that you might have in the, in the, in the meeting. But I will be coming late to the dinner, but uh, otherwise Tom will be hosting. And it turns out that Tom is a chemist, and he studies inorganic uh, chemistry. And one day we were walking along uh, Lake Michigan, and he asked me um, this question. Why is there so much zinc in the sperm? A very simple question. And I said <laughs> what I think are the three most unfortunate words of my life, I don't care. <laughs> and so Tom and I walked in silence, which is not often, but we walked in silence after that profound uh, sentence. And, you know, his lower lip was trembling, and I thought, well, what's wrong with you? I'd forgotten the whole conversation by this point. And he said, well, you don't care about zinc. You don't care about everything I do. Blah, blah, blah. I said, no, Tom, it's not that I don't care about zinc. It's that I don't care about sperm. <laughs> Tell me about zinc in the egg, and then we can talk. Never thought about it. And it turned out there was zero literature on zinc in the sperm. And in fact, zinc had been identified, in, uh, there had been zinc identified in the sperm. Nobody had ever studied zinc in the egg. Nobody even thought to look. So based on that argument, Tom and I made what is a true discovery in biology, something that no one had ever looked for or even thought to look for. Most science is built heuristically on the shoulders of someone else's discovery. This had no antecedent. It was really only because Tom had the, um, the essential equipments and technology, and I had the cell and the biology. And we began with a graduate student who at first didn't know we were married, so that was really good. Uh, uh, she was a rotating student, and we ended up making one of the most profound discoveries in reproductive science. Thank goodness, because what we discovered is at the time of fertilization, zinc is released from the egg as this massive exocytosis, or what we call the zinc spark. And this was a discovery, again, that could not have been made but for the fact that the two of us were studying different things. Those were in mouse eggs. This is in human. The one on the left is not activated. The two in the middle are, in fact, activated. And what you'll see in the moment is at the moment of activation, the release of zinc in one of the most beautiful biological events we've ever seen called the zinc spark. And um, this actually became, and in fact, in this, in this talk, I'll be sh sharing with you uh, three Discovery Magazine discoveries of the year. And these were discoveries that were noted in other places as well. But um, Discover Magazine identifies the discoveries uh, that are most important. And, and I've had three. And uh, I think that's the record for, for discovery. So it's really exciting and profound. 
this was listed as one of the major moments in assisted reproductive uh, history. And it started back with um, the first uh, baby born using frozen sperm going through Louise Brown. And um, they indicated that research, when we found that the zinc spark, um, that represents one of those major moments. And you can imagine, because for IVF patients or for others, uh, being able to determine which egg is most likely to go on and provide live birth non-invasively is a really critical and uh, important uh, applied option for this work, not just the fundamental discovery, which is of its own, uh, for the, our own knowledge of this time, really critical, but also for women's reproductive health. And in fact, I was invited to give uh, the talk at Louise Brown's, who was the first IVF baby, um, her 40th birthday uh, party, uh, I was uh, invited to give the talk. And she was so excited about the zinc spark. So she said, I was clearly a beautiful zinc spark. And I said, <laughs> you clearly were a beautiful zinc spark. So um, my prediction number two really is that advances in 21st century knowledge and both in uh, the generation as well as its implementation requires work done in partnership with a well-informed public. So an investment in the next generation of innovators will in fact improve our, glo our globe. So this work in reproductive science has at points in our history been fraught and it should not be. It is our own biology of understanding how our reproductive health works and making sure that we have the next generation of um, students who come into this field I think is really quite critical. So opening the door to education, and I had a series of slides that I took out that I'm only recalling now that I took out, but really is building this um, competency in mentorship. So when we discovered the Zinc Spark was when I was developing um, this mentoring program that is, um, f was long before um, uh, students came from high schools into, um, at least into Northwestern. And so we literally opened the door to students from the Chicago Public Schools to come in and be part of this educational dimension, and not only those students, but their parents. And that led to uh, a brand new trajectory for so many of our students. And I think the more we learn and the more we discover and the better we teach, there is an interoperability between that discovery and learning. And here at Michigan State, that really is part of our secret sauce. In fact, our faculty teach. Um, at many universities, it'll be TAs. At this university, our faculty teach. And it is that our faculty teach both what is that found knowledge, that knowledge that you have to learn in the back of the book, and that knowledge that is created from what I call vertical learning, where you learn how to ask questions and be able to derive the answers uh, along the way. Uh, and I think that is really a critical part of the success of Michigan State, our 82% graduation rate, 11% higher than US News and World Report says we should be graduating based on the demographics of students who come to our institution. That is an extraordinary metric. And through our strategic plan and with our deans that you'll be talking with later today, we have uh, ambition to increase that to 86%. That is an extraordinary metric of success for every student who comes to this institution. Uh, that, uh, and it is our promise that we will develop the opportunity for them through continually engaging in our own learning, our own discovery, and in the teaching that empowers them. So the last story that I'll tell very quickly and then hopefully take a few questions if we still have time is in this domain of fertility preservation or fertili pre preservation of fertility after cancer. And um, this story really begins when I left Genentech and was recruited to a number of places but decided to go back to Northwestern where I had been a graduate student as a, as a professor. So um, uh, when I went back, the director of the, of the cancer center at the time asked me to be on one of the leadership teams for our cancer center. I said, well, I'm not a cancer biologist. I'm a reproductive scientist. So I, I really don't do that kind of, of work. And he said, yeah, I understand. But I really like your leadership. I like the way you engage. I like the way you work. And in fact, um, this portfolio includes uh, a lot of philanthropy. And so we have to inspire those um, scientists to build that next generation of cancer biology. So well, 
okay, well, let's give this a try. So in fact, uh, became that uh, uh, eventually the basic science director for the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, and in fact, we now have ambition through MSU to have a federally um, uh, designated uh, comprehensive cancer center. So I'm very excited about what Norm Beauchamp through uh, Henry Ford Health is doing to enable uh, this opportunity. Um, but, you know, so uh, here I was, reproductive scientist, directing the basic science for all these cancer biologists, and I was sitting in a leadership meeting, and um, this was uh, in the mid-90s, and the, uh, what I learned is that a, um, a boy, 16-year-old boy, was being transported down by ambulance from the pediatric hospital to our main hospital to bank sperm. And uh, I thought, and so this was mentioned, and of course it was so rare that it was mentioned in this leadership meeting. And I said, well, that's really amazing. That's really fantastic. Ken thought about it. I said, well, what do we do for females? And immediately the physician said, oh, the young women shouldn't worry about that. They need to really focus on their cancer care. And I thought, well, wait a second. That doesn't work. In fact, that young male has uh, sperm cells that if even one is protected from the cancer treatment will actually restore and regenerate. Females have all the eggs we'll ever have in the ovary at the time of birth. About one million eggs are in female ovaries at the time of birth. And those eggs then uh, continually either go through a process of cell death or they ovulate until the time of menopause and then they're gone. There is no, there is no fountain of youth for the ovary once those eggs are gone. <laughs> And so that kind of was a little bit puzzling again. And so it was from that story that became an entirely new field of medicine that uh, I coined the term oncofertility, fertility management for young cancer patients. And this really starts with, as you'll recall, um, Nixon, um, I think it was 1972, Nixon declared the war on cancer. And uh, during that uh, then ensuing uh, period of time, the engine of discovery really increased so that we now have more and more survivors of cancer, including more and more survivors who are of younger age. And so these same life-preserving treatments that have been developed over time, including cisplatinum, which was developed here at Michigan State University, perhaps the most profound discovery that has saved more lives than any other cancer therapy was discovered here at Michigan State University. And our entire MSU foundation is predicated on that discovery. And Ethel, we do appreciate that you are now on that board and helping us to steward uh, the, that uh, innovation that has really had impact uh, across the world. So when I came to Michigan State University, knowing that this was the home of cisplatinum, that it saved so many lives and that my own research had preserved their fertility, it really was a, a very magical moment. Of course, I was all alone because it was COVID and I couldn't tell anybody how excited this is. So I'm telling all of you just how exciting this really was. But that threat to fertility for males um, for sperm banking, this was before even um, Lance Armstrong had his uh, famous case that was managed at, uh, at, at Indiana no females were offered fertility management. So uh, I coined a term and uh, created, when you coin a term and create a new field of medicine, I figured, well, you can create your own ribbon. And it turned out when you look it up, uh, all the ribbon colors have been taken. The Armstrong Foundation, which was founded a few years later, and I was so privileged to work with them uh, uh, as well, they figured, well, there's no ribbon colors. That's when they made the bracelet. You remember the yellow bracelet that we all used to wear? That's because there were no ribbon colors. So uh, I didn't think of new jewelry options. So, you know, Janet, I should have thought of making my own jewelry, but I didn't. So I actually took two colors, which um, was the first dual colored ribbon in medical, in the, in medical use. And it was the, uh, the royal purple, the deep purple knowledge of self and who I am intertwined with that Spartan green, which I didn't realize then, but it is the spring green of eternal hopefulness. And so those were intertwined to show the interdisciplinarity that was necessary to build this field. And the little dots are eggs or sperm or ovaries or testis or uterus, uh, whatever it is that you need in your fertility um, journey. And that spools into the normal ribbon, but you can see my ribbon is slightly expectant. 
So that represented the beginning of a field of medicine that's just been so extraordinary. And I just returned last night from DC. And um, we have a bill that is marked up in DC. The advocates, uh, patient advocates do this, not, not universities. But uh, they've been working to champion insurance and reimbursement. And Debbie Wasserman uh, Smith, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, uh, has a bill that is bipartisanly um, um, been um, championed for Medicaid access for young oncofertility cases. Now, this is extraordinary because when we started this in 1999, zero women were being offered fertility preservation options uh, in the cancer setting. And now there are babies born, and you know there's uh, 12 days of average wait. One of the issues was, well, these women can't possibly wait um, to actually go through fertility management. And the, ca and the uh, cancer docs would say, oh, those hormones are, those pesky hormones. I don't know why hor female hormones are always preferenced by pesky, but they are. Those pesky hormones uh, cause cancer. Uh, and the uh, reproductive scientists were never used to working in the fast-paced domain that cancer care required. So we had to actually create a new corridors of communication, create a wholly new subspecialty of medicine. And options and time are now available even in uh, uh, breast cancer hormone positive settings. And these fertility interventions, in fact, can improve compliance. What one of my uh, students, who is now a, um, an associate um, uh, vice president at University of Michigan, showed when she was in my lab, that uh, these fertility interventions ensured that young patients would stay compliant with their chemotherapy and radiation because they were confident of their future fertility. So um, the last thing I'll share with you is not only do we, do we intervene in the ordinary, the IVF setting, we also have ex uh, intervened in the new research that will be the new dimension. And again, I told you we're all born with all the follicles we'll ever have. Well, it turns out for, for, um, for females, that is the reservoir of follicles from which for future not only fertility but endocrine hormones can come. And so we actually have a program that uh, removes part of the tissue for, when, for um, uh, infants as uh, young as six months old. And you can see one of those tissues. Those are each individual eggs for that particular individual. And I think this one is three years old. But also within that tissue, you may not be able to see it. The green cells are the cells of the cancer. So that tissue can't be transplanted. But there are now hundreds of patients for whom we've transplanted tissue back and have had live, healthy birth. That's a breakthrough that I'm hopping over. And let me tell you what we're doing for those patients who have cancer within the cells. And that is, um, and we were unable to actually do any of this before the research that I'll tell you. And that's a, uh, that is a follicle that um, um, one of the, my favorite follicles of, I'm sure all of you have a favorite follicle. That is my favorite follicle. Uh, and it comes from the time I was a graduate student. And what you see is an egg sitting with cells that are called nurse cells. And then the cells that are etched in black, those are the cells that make the hormones. And you see that this uh, follicle is moving toward the outside where ultimately it will ovulate. An egg going from the inside to the outside in ovulation is um, the most remarkable autocatalytic self-destructive event inside the body that ever occurs. There is no other tissue that has to tear apart the outside part of that tissue to allow the cell to go from the inside to the outside. And so we needed to recapitulate all of those processes in a dish. And so with my students, what you're seeing there, that little ball, it's a little bit of jelly. Alginate, which is something that's the thickener in ice cream, turned out to be a biomaterial. And I should have said earlier, my, my appointments are in biomedical engineering, in the College of Engineering, and in OBGYN in human uh, med. And so we engineered environment for these follicles to grow completely outside the body. And we were able to trigger ovulation with the hormones. What you're seeing is the egg going from the inside to the outside. Now, all of you have ovulated. How many of you have seen ovulation before? <laughs> Since you haven't, I'm going to show you a lot more. See? All of that represents ovulation in a dish. It never happened before. It was one of the most profound things that we had ever seen uh, uh, happen in a dish. And out of that uh, came live birth, my two favorite mice. Uh, newborn and new age, also recognized as one of the breakthroughs um, uh, of, a, of a decade. I called it newborn and new age. These were my two first favorite mice, but there have been a lot more. <laughs> and um, this also led us to try and figure out for these young cancer patients, not only do they want 
in some cases, biological offspring, and there's many other stories there to tell, but also endocrine support. And endocrine hormones are not just about the reproductive system, they're about the totality of the body system. But we only study one tissue in a, in a dish at a time, so we threw away all our Petri dishes, and we invented a series of devices that allow us to take each organ of the body and put them into communication with each other called microfluidics. And with this, we've been able to take ovary, fallopian tube, uterus, cervix, and a liver for metabolism, and we've developed a 28-day cycle. So a full menstrual cycle in a dish. This had never occurred before. This was another discovery of the year. Uh, and as a consequence of that, the downstream tissue, which had never been in any biological setting, cultured with an ovary, you see those cells going like this? Those are the fallopian tubes that move the egg down the dish. Nobody had ever looked at that in vitro before. And for the first time, we're now studying all these tissues in the same way they are in the body, not as flat cells on a Petri dish, but in their structure, in the structural ways they are. This is going to change the world in the next 20 years. And that's because all the biology we know is from cells that are separated from each other, do not have the hormone fluctuations of either male or female uh, hormones, and are not in communication with other tissues that condition those cells and their function. So I think we're going to rewrite the entirety of cell biology, and that's going to, in itself, give way to a whole new medical pipeline that will and is starting here at Michigan State. We also, and this is my final story, built an ovary through 3D printing. So we took the tissue of the ovary, and because we need to be able to transplant these follicles back for durable cycles, these pediatric cases are not looking for fertility. They need to get through puberty. So we need to build back the ovary's competency to, um, to actually uh, develop endocrine hormones. And in fact, we were able to do that. And that 3D printed ovary, which I call an ovary bioprosthetic, is the first ever 3D printed soft organ to ever function in any animal or human. That's a breakthrough. Uh, and so, uh, all these things, though, require us to do what MSU does so well, which is integrative thinking. We don't think in monolithic ways. We think in ways that brings all of the work together. So we think about the legal concerns, the religious constraints, all the other matters that may be important. And I was going to finish with one little movie, which I think is not going to function, which might be good, Kim, because I think we're out of time. Um, but uh, let me see if this was, I'll just tell you, I think it's not going to run. If it doesn't run, this is from how many people watch The Young and the Restless? <laughs> Young and the Restless. Lily, that's, Lily. that's Lily for all you. So it turns out that it is going to run? So I'm going to pause it there. And so at the end of this, there's more argument, more argument, more argument. And at the end, Lily escapes from the emergency room, and she's on the run. <laughs> so I'm sitting, I'm sitting at, at, in Chicago, and we actually had a humanities festival that, that I had all the leading minds uh, in this area come together. And I get a text that said, are, are you going to be on a television show? I'm like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. She's on the run, and literally the entire Oncofertility world was on pins and needles to see what was going to happen. And the Oncofertility world at the time was pretty small, but uh, now it is a true field of medicine. Uh, and uh, it is in every medical school. And in fact, just last week, Rick Leach was in Florida, and we got the largest gift ever to reproductive science for Oncofertility at MSU. So Lily is on the run. In this next clip, she is now with two others that you'll tell us who they are. But, uh, and uh, this, is, this is the last clip that I'll share. Take me to Chicago. A doctor will help me there. Now she can say, take me to East Lansing. A doctor will help me here. And in fact, you can go to any medical school in America and most of them around the world, and they'll help you there.
So when grants and papers meet clinical problems, patient needs are met and can change a devastating diagnosis into a series of life-affirming inter uh, interventions, which we call bench to bedside to babies. So the take-home message really are these three things, the first of which is include all of us. And this is something that's been a secret to Michigan State for a long time. We have been one of the most inclusive campuses. We have more to do, and we are working on that. We have a diversity plan that Jabbar Bennett has been leading that is just extraordinary. Uh, if you haven't picked that up, yes, thank you. Please pick it up uh, because it is, it is one of three plans we have, and it is really critical. We have to continue to learn, discover, and teach. And what you've seen for Michigan State University is that after the events of the last nine weeks, it was not the first time that we said grace and empathy and accommodation with achievement, with attainment, with excellence. And that's why this campus has rebounded in the way it has. And I'm so proud and delighted that uh, we'll be um, shaking 10,000 hands in two weeks uh, for graduation. And I look forward to seeing what this uh, group of students will do and the imprint they have had will be that which they take in the world and the world most urgently needs these students uh, for not only what they've been through but the way in which they think and the way in which they act. And then finally, there is a purpose drivenness, uh, which is that latter piece, that you have to continue to really see that purpose for the work you're doing. And at Michigan State, uh, as many of you heard last year when I spoke, we transitioned our admissions not from major, what's your major, but what's your mission? What's your mission in life? And that's something that is really a newfound way in which we are attracting really the most extraordinary students in the nation and in the world. And I'll look forward to welcoming this next class in this fall as the academic seasons continue to go, go forward. So with that, thank you for indulging me in a little bit of my own work and the way in which we are, this is both imprinted by and working uh, forward at Michigan State University. It's great to be interim president. It's also great to be a professor at Michigan State University.